Welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. I want to start, if I can, with a bit of an exercise, if I may. I want you to imagine that when you woke up in the morning, there was Jesus standing right next to you, ready for you. You got in your car, he was sitting with you. You went to work, he was right there beside you. You went about your day, you were in the tea room or the lunch room or you went to school and he was right there with you. Imagine you're at school or you're at the gym or you're playing basketball or you're watching TV. You're going home and he's right there with you the whole time. (laughs) What would that feel like? What kind of confidence would you have? (laughs) You'd have dinner, he's there with you. You'd put your head on the pillow, he's there tucking you in. Imagine what that would be like. What would it be like for you? Like, how would it change your outlook? What would you ask him? When you're pushing the shopping trolley and then the shopping, should I buy that, Lord? Should I spend my money on this? Or if someone confronts you and they're giving you a hard time, Lord, I, don't, I, I really don't feel like loving this person right now. Can you give me the strength? That's what it was like for the disciples. The three, three and a half years, they had Jesus with them, day in, day out. Every day, they had him. And then we, we've spent some time in John's Gospel. We're going to read in John chapter 16. I'm going to turn, if I may, John chapter 16. Jesus says, just before he goes, he's predicting his death, and the disciples know that he's about to go, and they're filled with grief because Jesus is foretelling his Death is to come, and they're sad, they're anxious, they're in trouble. Jesus says in verse 5, But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. This is really important. And Gary, who preached an outstanding message last Sunday, if you haven't heard it, click on to our Facebook or our YouTube. It's a brilliant message. He referred to this last week. Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. And when he comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Let's think about that for a second. The disciples of Jesus had Jesus with them every day for three and a half years and they're pretty concerned they're pretty anxious because he's about to go and Jesus says something really interesting he says it's actually to your advantage that I go it's better for you that I go because if I go then the helper will come or the advocate the New Living Translation says advocate another version might say the counsellor the better word is parakletos which actually means in John 14 refers to this, another helper, another advocate, one who is like Jesus. That's actually what it means. Parakletos is one who is like to come alongside. That's what it says. First John, he uses the same word, parakletos. Jesus is also a parakletos referred to in First John. Check it out. It's really interesting. And the spirit is a parakletos as well. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, distinct, different, unique, but they're one. And Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go, because when I go, I will send you the helper. I will send you the counselor. I will send you the comforter. I will send you the advocate, the parakletos, the one who will come alongside you and advocate. It's to your advantage. We now have something better than what we thought about before. Every day, we now have 24-7 access to Jesus. All of us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have His Spirit with us. Not just with, but in. The Holy Spirit is living in us. The rest of this month in July, we're going to continue to explore what it is to live in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. How do we hear Him? How do we move in Him? How, how, How do we sense Him? What does it look like when we are walking and living in the Holy Spirit? We're going to be talking about the gifts, the motivational gifts, the ministry gifts, the manifestation gifts, all those sorts of things that come that the Spirit gives. 
And what, do, what is it like to be a believer, even a church community, that really is living in the Spirit? It's to your advantage we have Him with us and in us, so that when you're pushing that shopping trolley, you just talk to Him. Ask Him. Ask Him for guidance or help, encouragement, strength, direction. When you're driving your car and you've got Darlene Check and you sense the unction of function and you're just banging out those tunes and you can't hit the notes, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you're at home washing up the dishes, he's with you. He's with you. What do you need? What help do you need? What comfort do you need? What counsel do you need? What advocacy do you need? God himself, the parakletos, is with and in us. I want to see if we can to turn to Galatians because Paul talks a lot about the Holy Spirit and he writes in this letter to the Galatians very clearly about what it is to experience freedom and liberty by the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 is, um, is a great chapter that Paul starts to compare and contrast what it is to live by the Spirit and what it is to live by the law. And what he says, in essence, is we have this Holy Spirit, we have the person of God, we have the presence and the power and the peace that comes by the Holy Spirit. We have Him, but don't use that as as a license to live however you want to live according to the flesh. Carnality, He's saying, listen, you've got this freedom now. So let him live in you and through you. That was a great testimony, Isaac. It's the Holy Spirit, God himself, who lives in and through. And what's one of the great evidences, the great miracles that God is at work? A transformed life. You look for the trans- If you want to know if God's working in your heart and your life, look to see if he's changing you. If you're becoming stiff and starchy and you've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, I've become a Christian, oh, I've done all my changing, I've, I've graduated to maturity now. <laughs> you missed it. Because the, one of the great passions and purposes of Holy Spirit is to come in, dwell in, dine with and transform us and to make us more like Jesus. Romans 8 tells us this, that we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, which means God's Spirit comes in us to will and work for His good pleasure. He makes us like Jesus. He moves us from glory to glory. So I don't have to do these hard works to try and become like Jesus. No, He does it naturally from the inside out. So I focus less on behavior management And let him do the heart transformation. And from that heart transformation, then the outworkings come. So let's go from Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 16 to 25. Colin, if you can stand up and read for us in the ESV. Thank you. Galatians 5, verses 16 to 25. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Brilliant. Amen. Verse 16 says, thank you for reading that, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep 
you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, if you are led by, by, by whom? The Spirit. The Spirit's not just a force, He's a person. John 14 and 16, you can see Jesus refers to Him as, it's a He. He will guide you into all truth. Um, in Ephesians 4, and I think around verse, verse 30, the Holy Spirit is a person that can be uh, grieved. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. He's not just a force. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, how can we be led by the Spirit? How does it happen? What does it look like? Well, here's how not to be led by the Spirit. you be led by someone or something else. The Bible does not say, but if you are led by an ungodly culture. Don't be led by an ungodly culture. Be very careful about this. We cannot be led by the Holy Spirit and the ungodly culture that we live in at the same time. It can't be done. It can't be done. How, how can we be led by an ungodly culture? What does an ungodly culture look like? Well, it's not just a matter of uh, what's happening out there. It could be in our own personal circles as well. You know, there could be ungodly cultures in our friendship circles, our relational circles, even amongst Christians. There could be ungodly cultural habits, even amongst Christians. I was talking to my, my girls, girls about this. Uh, we we're having a conversation in the car just this week, and we we're talking about swearing. Swearing. Oh, gee, some of you are looking away right now. Just listen. Sort of... And so even something like swearing, they were saying, well, we, we were told by, um, we're talking about swearing, and they said, oh, no, we don't swear, and then and one of them's starting to s- spell it out because they hear it in the schoolyard, and I get all of that, right? And, and, and I said, well, look, you know, it's, it's not God-honoring, is it, to swear? You? Well, no, but we were told by someone else, and it's, it's another Christian person that they know, that it's okay to swear, it's neither bad nor good, it's just a, a way to express yourself. I'm like, okay, well, let's think about that. And, and it was an occasion to really talk, look... Okay, there are Christians that might say those sorts of things, but what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach us? We, let's come back. Have, has, has God changed or have we changed? So if, if what God says back here, what does he talk about? Well, he says it talks about foul language. Don't let anything unwholesome come from your mouth. Anything that's foul, don't let it come from your mouth. And so when talking to the girls, I said, you know, it doesn't just stop with, with naughty swear words. It could also be humor. It could be nasty things that we're saying. It could be gossipy. It could be those sorts of things. I said, oh, yeah, and then one of them pipes up. Yes, Dad, it's not what... Un- it's not what's... <laughs> They're beautiful. It's not what goes in a person's mouth that makes them unclean, but what comes out. I said, oh, you have been learning well, Padawan learner. I felt conviction right there in the car as we're driving to school. <laughs> Isn't that true? So is what we're saying God-honoring? Is what's coming from our mouth God honoring? Or will we make up an excuse to sin? So, why do I bring that up? Even in godly circles and relational circles, there can be ungodly habits that, are, that we're being led by. It may not just be in the interpersonal friendships that we have, though it is important to note. Our, our, um, our connections, our friendships do very much persuade where we go. What does it say in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15 and 33? It says, bad company corrupts good character or good habits. That doesn't mean we avoid ourselves from mingling or talking or connecting or loving with those that are different to us. No, we're commanded to love one another. We're even commanded to love our enemies. But the question is, who is influencing who? So in the same way, uh, we can have an ungodly culture with our relationships, also the world that we live in, the, 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 the things that we watch on our phones or our TV screens or the magazines that we read. It's very important. The enemy is trying to conform us to the ways of this world. The Bible says in Romans 12 verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, transformed, changed by the renewing of our mind, that by testing you will be able to discern what is the good and pleasing will of God. 
Don't be led by an ungodly culture. Don't also be led by, here we go, personal feelings. Sometimes your feelings can lead you astray. Am I the only one? But my heart's leading me in this direction. Oh, but my heart says. Sometimes your heart can betray you. Indeed, God can speak to you and through you with your heart. He does do those sorts of things. But be very mindful. Is what God is leading and impressing on you in your heart or with your feelings line up with what the Bible says? In Acts 17, we we learn about the Brahans, that they had the word that was being preached to them and they liked what they heard, but they had to search the scriptures. Daily, they were checking it out. Does it fit within the framework of what God's word says? Well, how how do I know what God's saying? Well, he, he sounds like what he wrote. And so if, he, if, if we have the framework of his word, his Bible, his written word that he's revealed to us, and we sense, my heart tells me, but he's telling me I'm to love that other person, even though I'm married, that's probably not God, because it doesn't fit in the framework there. Oh, it's getting uncomfortable at work. I need to quit now. I just sense God saying, oh, it's too hard for you, you better jump ship now. But God may not be saying that. He might be saying, stay right there. I want you there. Oh, but like time. But Gary did a great offering presentation this morning. I I feel like God's really calling me to start giving again. Oh, yeah, but my bank balance says, no, I need need the money for the Fremantle Dockers membership this year because I really sense they're going to make it to the finals. My heart leads me. Be very, very careful with your heart and what it says. Even Jesus himself in Luke 22, 42, you know, Jesus himself was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And... He says, Father, I'm not willing to die. He didn't want to. But what did he say? Not my will. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Let's bring it in a check. Not my will, but your will be done. What about surrounding circumstances that we live in? This is a tricky one. Don't be led doesn't say, but if you are led by surrounding circumstances. Don't, don't be led by surrounding circumstances. Sometimes God can speak to us through our surrounding circumstances, but he often confirms what he's saying through surrounding circumstances. And so we've got to discern. Don't just go with the flow. Go, oh, well, it's seemingly good, so it must be God, or it's seemingly bad, so it must be the Spirit. Don't, don't go on those terms of engagement just because it looks good doesn't mean that it's God just because it looks bad doesn't mean that it's not in Acts there's an example of Paul and um, he he was on a boat and I might turn us there if we can just to show you that I'm not making it up Um, Acts 27 verse 10 where is the book of Acts is it in the New Testament or the Old Testament Before or after Maccabees? Acts 27. Okay, verse 10. Um, Paul says, uh, when they're about to hop on the boat, he goes, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. That's what Paul said. But it says a few verses later in verse 13, when the south wind blew gently... Supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and they sailed along Crete, close to the shore. So it seemed good, it looked good to the the sailors that were there. To Paul it was, Paul's like, hey listen, I'm not so sure about this. But but, but the sailors, the experts, they said, hang on, there's just a a, a gentle wind, this is going to be good. But then it says, "But but soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and couldn't face the wind, we gave way to it and we're driven along. So they were under trouble. Paul was right. Be very mindful, just because it looks good and smells good, that it, it still may not be God. It still may not be His Spirit. Sometimes He will say things and lead in directions that may appear and would be quite counterproductive to the natural. Has He ever told you to do something that's so crazy? It doesn't make sense. That the Spirit, should I say the Holy Spirit, would do something holy? different, out of the box. Maybe we just got to let the Holy Spirit be holy once in a while. But if you are led by the Spirit, 
if you are led by the Spirit, if you are led by the Spirit, in verse 18 it says, you are not under the law. And then Paul does something really interesting here. He now starts to compare and contrast what it's like when you're led by the Spirit and what it's like when you're not led by the Spirit. So we see what he calls works of the flesh and then fruit of the Spirit. Works of the flesh. Works of the flesh. What does it look like? I'm going to read now from the New Living Translation. This is what it says from verse... 18 onwards it says when you are directed by the spirit you're not under obligation to the law of Moses when you follow the desires of your sinful nature the results are very clear so can we just say right now change in words so the flesh is essentially your sinful nature it's the part of you that is opposed to what God wants that's what it is the flesh is not just your physical touching it's not, it, it's not that. It's the part of you that is in opposition to God. So within us, there is a tussle that goes on between what God wants and what we want. And I was in life group having a conversation with the guys on, on Tuesday about this. Remember the old cartoons how you'd have the little, the good angel and the bad angel on your shoulder? And one of the guys, Graham, he goes, yeah, I was always the bad guy. I was the bad angel for my friends. <laughs> and so uh, that might be a crass way of picturing that within us, there are two... natures at war competing for fulfillment and Paul writes when you follow the desires of your flesh or your sinful nature the results are very clear this is now I want to read through this I'm not going to rush through it right you can say an amen or an ouch as I read it when you follow the desires of your sinful nature the results are clear so this is what it starts to look like when we don't follow the spirit when we follow the sinful nature this is what it starts to look like Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, Dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I've told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Was there an amen or an ouch as I read through that list? Let's be honest. How many people sometimes struggle with those? That's me. There are some of those things as I'm reading, I'm like, oh my goodness. Now, what he's not saying is he's not saying if you practice this from time to time, then you're stuffed. And what he's saying is if you live a lifestyle where these things are continually being produced, these works of the flesh, it might tell you something about the health of your soul. So let's, uh, let's go back to these delicious uh, these, these avocados. Oh, thank you, Gary. Look, look how healthy they are. How healthy are these? Oh, nectar of the gods. Bring them over, my brother. Oh. There we go. Jeez. What the dickens are these, mate? Is that a quince? Are you trying to tempt me, you temptress? Guava, okay. Very good. So how does Gary get such great fruit off his avocado tree and his guava tree? How does he... There are two things. Uh, that come to mind to help you have a healthier tree. There's pruning and poo-poo. Pruning. John 15 talks all about pruning, doesn't it? That the Lord is a brilliant gardener and he'll prune us. Why does he prune us? Because he wants to keep us healthy. He wants fruit to be produced. And we've got any fruit trees and you chuck fertilizer at the base? This stinks, doesn't it? It's mucky. I've got to put gloves on. I don't like touching that stuff. Pruning and poo-poo. A couple of the tools that the Lord employs for us 
as he's trying to cultivate his fruit through us. It's not our fruit, it's his fruit. Watch this, let's read on. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And then it says, verse 24, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So Paul says, how do you know if you're led by the Spirit? Well, if you're led by the Spirit, there's going to be fruit. And not just your fruit, it's going to be a fruit. It's going to be fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. Well, how do you know if you're not led by the Spirit? Well, there's going to be works of the flesh, things that we do. Things that we do in and of our own strength, that, 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 that's not what we want. That, that we, we might be able to get results. We might get, to get stuff accomplished, but that's not fruit. True fruit and fruit that remains comes from God himself. And God does the work in us and he produces the fruit. What does some of that pruning and fertilizer look like? We, let's say love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we want those types of fruit in our lives, which shows that we're led by the Spirit, that we're living in the Spirit, what might the Lord do? If I want, if I want to experience peace in the middle of the storm, <clears throat> what's the Lord going to do? He's going to chuck me in a boat and expose me to a storm. How can I learn to have peace and rest in Him unless there's opportunity for that rest to be tested? Oh, Lord, I want patience. I I like that fruit. I love patience. What's He going to do? He's going to give me three beautiful daughters that test my patience. I want love. Lord, I just want to be a loving love machine. He's going to give me opportunities where a lot of bit of hate's going to come out to the surface. All the impurities are going to come out. And when these things come out, it's not easy, is it? Why? Because it is a crucifying process within us. It's a dying experience within us. So in a sense, I have been crucified with Christ, but I am still being crucified with Christ. I am sharing in that experience. How does that happen? Well, it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit... Who, remember, he comes in, dines in, dwells with, and lives through us. And he does the work. Again, Philippians, Paul says, Philippians chapter 2, it is the Spirit who works within. It is God who works within to will and work for his good pleasure. His good pleasure. For his good pleasure. So, fruit of the Spirit ultimately looks like Jesus. That's what we're talking about here. Someone that looks like Jesus. All that fruit coming out, that's Jesus right there. You want the epitome of love? That's Jesus. Of joy? That's Jesus. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Who is the one who epitomizes all of those things and things like that? That's Jesus himself. So the Spirit, remember, he is looking to work within us because, again, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So the Spirit comes in and empowers us to make us like Jesus, and we've got to just, we've just got to yield, just surrender. Let it go. And so as we heard Isaac share earlier, that there, there are things that he wanted to do before, sin that he wanted to do before, but now it's kind of not there anymore. It's not there. Why do we sin? Well, because we like it. That's why we do it, because we enjoy it. But what if God could change the desires of our heart that we don't want to do that anymore? Wouldn't it be so much easier? So Lord, I pray your spirit would change my heart, shape my heart and get rid of those desires I don't want to do that. I don't want to say that. I don't want to think that anymore. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So in brief, 
Walking by the Spirit is a matter of three things. It's about a leaning on. It's about a listening to. And it's about a living out. A leaning on. Leaning on. How do I live in the Spirit? How do I walk by the Spirit? The first thing is about leaning on Him. Dependence. I depend on you. I depend on you. I was praying with one of my girls yesterday morning. We were just talking about, just felt to just thank the Lord again about the every breath that we breathe in. It's a gift. Every breath is a gift. And Lord, may we trust and rely and depend on you like that. I can't live by the Spirit without the Spirit. And I just don't want to know what he's telling me to do. I need his strength to do it. He's my helper. That we would lean on him. The second thing I mentioned is a listening to. That's an attentiveness. What's he saying? Does he only speak on a Sunday morning for a couple of hours? Does he only speak in a life group meeting for a couple of hours? Does he only speak when I'm listening to Chris Tomlin in the car? Or can he speak at any moment of every day? Let's get him out of the box. What are you saying? And can I also say that being, 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 being a church that is led by the Spirit does not... Can we not just reduce God to swinging from the chandeliers in our services? You can be a church community and you can have signs and wonders and miracles happen left, right and center, but you could still be immature, selfish and living in the flesh. Hello, is this thing on? Can you hear me? I think the danger is we, we, we indeed do this. We reduce, oh, I just want to be part of a church that's all spiritual and spirit-led and spirit-filled and Shanda Mahanda, bought a Honda, rode it to Kalamunda. And yet what we're doing is we're living in the flesh. If you want to know what a church community or, or a Christian or a believer looks like that is mature and being led by the Spirit, look for the fruit of the Spirit, not just the signs of the Spirit. You can see the signs of the Spirit and still be totally carnal. Why? Because God is sovereign and He's good and He shows up and He shows off from time to time. But if you want to know a man or a woman of God who is godly, is there love? Is there peace? Is there patience? Is there kindness? Is there goodness? Is there faithfulness? Is there gentleness? Is there self-control? And things like that. May we celebrate those things. Let's celebrate those things. Because that's what Jesus looks like. That's a clear evidence of the Spirit at work. A listening to, an attentiveness. Which means when you're looking for your next job, maybe the Holy Spirit will say something like, uh, I want you to take the lesser paying job. What? That can't be the Holy Spirit. (laughs) God does say things like that because he's got a bigger purpose in mind. That might mean that the Holy Spirit might prompt you. You be the first one to forgive. You be the first one to love. You be the first one to demonstrate grace. You be the first one. You, you, you. May there be a flexibility and a sensitivity to what he's saying because he speaks beyond a sermon too it could be a soft whisper in your heart and it might be so counterintuitive so if there's a leaning on and a listening to there's also got to be a living out that's obedience there's no point in knowing what the holy spirit's saying and doing if we're not willing to do anything with it Pastor Margaret was going to be here. This is one of my favorite stories from Pastor Margaret. She couldn't make it this morning. But Pastor Margaret, a number of years ago, was having chronic lower back issues. And uh, she heard a bit of a crazy voice tell her to get a lemon, cut it in half, and rub it morning and evening on her lower back where her pain was. She didn't tell anyone. She would have been laughed at. I I would have had a little chuckle in my heart as well, to be honest with you. But she did it out of obedience. She depended on God for this. She had a confidence that it was God, so she just did it. 
by the end of the third day, the pain had gone. It had just gone. She had to do something with it. She had to actually obey. How many times has God told you to cut a lemon and rub it on your back? <laughs> it may not be as crazy as that. But whatever he prompts you to do, just do it. Walking by the Spirit is like that, just following Him as He leads you. Just, that's all it is, just following. And He says, go this way, and then we, okay, I'll, I'll go that way. I'll do it now, I'll go that way. It's not limited to the person holding the microphone. It's everyone that loves Jesus receives the Holy Spirit, His very presence to live within. We all have the same access, so let's not make excuses. We all have the same access. If we've got Jesus, we have everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need. You have it. You take him with you wherever you go. Just be aware of him. So, as we finish, I have some homework. Some take-home questions. And if you will, I'm mindful of time. You can take a photo of this if you will. There are five questions I want to leave with you. The first question is this. Do I genuinely want to be led by Holy Spirit? Or do I want to be led by myself? Second question, have I sincerely asked for his leadership? Or have I just assumed that it'll happen? Third question, will I actively look to God's word for guidance? Or am I too distracted? Fourth question, have I made space to listen for Holy Spirit's response? Or am I a little too busy? The final question is, will I humbly obey what he says? Or will my desire for convenience get in the way? We have an incredible invitation, church, to experience the very person of the Holy Spirit, the one who often gets left on the sidelines. And yet it's the very Spirit of God who seeks out, who saves, who transforms and sets us apart. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com dot au